Hey folks, welcome to the podcast today. Uh, you can see I've got a special guest with me, uh, Matt Little. Looking forward to uh, talking with Matt again after, what was about last month? Did we have you on or a little bit? Yeah, maybe a, a month or two, either yeah. November or December. I lose track of time, so <laughs> too much going on. But uh, glad to have Matt back again, and we're going to have a great episode today. Um, I'm just doing some stuff behind the scenes here. There we go. Good, good. I have a backup audio recording that I have to get started, and for some reason it was acting up, but we're, we're going. We're, we're rolling. So, guys, thanks for, uh, for participating in the podcast here today, and uh, we're going to talk about EDC Mindset uh, with Matt. He's got a lot of a uh, lot of great insight for us on that. Hey, Andrew, viewing on YouTube. Thanks for being a part of this today with us. Thanks. Good to have you. So um, I think we're going to get right into it. All right. Well, so we'll go ahead and begin the actual audio portion of the show that goes out to the podcast feed. And uh, yeah, you guys ready? Hey, Randy, John on Facebook. Thanks for checking in. So let's do it. In three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 477. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I am your host, Riley Bowman. And I have a special, uh, now he's two-time guest, slash, once you've been on more than once, Matt, you you, you can now be co-host. So congrats, <laughs> you've been promoted. We've got Matt Little with us, guys. <laughs> How you doing, sir? Doing good. Doing good. Good. Thanks good. for having me on today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Uh, we've got some good stuff planned for you guys today as we talk about EDC mindset. Uh, we've got a lot of really great uh, things to hit on today, and uh, buckle in and sit, sit, you know, or hold on tight because uh, we're gonna move right along through some some really great topics uh, at a pretty good clip, I think, uh, or at least at whatever clip we we decide to go. So uh, you guys should know that Matt is one of our featured instructors at the 2021 Guardian Conference. That's a sponsor message for today's episode. So head on over to guardianconference.com to check out this premier training event where we got a lot of great instructors like Matt who will be there for three days providing some of the best instruction in the country anywhere uh, for, for, for three days in Oklahoma. It's going to be a great time. You guys are going to really enjoy it. Uh, we've got about, about uh, well, we're not really, we're, we're playing with exactly what the, at, what the uh, uh, max numbers of attendees will be. Okay. Cause some of this is because we, this first time we've done this. All right. But what I can tell you is tickets are selling a lot better than I think I expected. So uh, you guys don't want to delay and find out that we've decided to cap that number and not be able to get a seat. So uh, head on over to guardianconference.com and right now take advantage of the early bird pricing. And don't forget that members of our Guardian Nation membership program get a huge substantial discount even off the early bird pricing. So you might want to consider checking out guardiannation.com if you want to learn more about what membership offers and to take advantage of that huge discount off of the 2021 Guardian Conference. And again, you're going to want to come and, and take take part in, tr in training courses with Matt Little and other fine instructors. You can see the whole list. And there may still be one or two more really cool instructors we get added to that list here before long. So guardianconference.com. And honorary sponsors of today's episode is, well, Matt Little's very own graybeardactual.com. I'd be remiss if we didn't mention that, uh, as far as I know, you haven't told me otherwise, that there's still some seats available in our training course we're hosting you for here in Colorado in May. Uh, and, of course, wherever you guys are, if you, if, you don't, if you don't live near Colorado or you're not able to travel here in May for a great course with myself also in attendance and Matt teaching, uh, check out Matt's entire schedule at graybeardactual.com. And uh, I know you got uh, several classes coming up. So well, thanks, Riley. I, I appreciate it. And yeah, there are still slots available in Colorado. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that class. We should have a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. 
For sure. And then don't forget that uh, Staccato 2011, another honorary sponsor of today's episode because, well, Matt, you, you work for them and you run their pistols. Yeah, there's that beautiful XC right there. Uh, yeah, awesome. So, guys, uh, appreciate staccato2011.com's website where you can find them and learn more. Uh, appreciate them and, and their support uh, and, and allowing Matt to come and do this with me. <laughs> Although I, I think you would have done it anyway, even if Staccato wasn't, I guess, necessarily involved. <laughs> no, we, we always have great conversations. I always look forward to, to where they're going to lead us and what we're going to wax philosophic about today. Well, indeed. What are we going to wax philosophically about? Well, so um, guys, some of the content for today's episode, uh, we're, we're kind of using as a framework some great blog posts that Matt wrote up on graybeardactual.com. Uh, I would encourage you to go read all of his stuff. Okay. Um, they're not super like long lengthy write-ups, but they're like straight to the point with like meat and potatoes, like good info. Right. And so uh, everyday carry is, I think where we're going to start it off here today. Um, you, you posted up about, about everyday carry. You kind of shared a little bit about, uh, what you carry, and this is the Concealed Carry Podcast. So, um, you know, let, let's actually throw it out there. What What is your EDC, Matt? And then let's kind of talk about some of the thought process that goes into your everyday carry, both in terms of the equipment, but also just, I guess, the philosophical approach to EDC. So I kind of look at it as whenever you're carrying truly concealed, not just low visibility, right? You're actually trying to be covert where nobody knows that you have these tools on you. It's always a compromise. You're always compromising between max effectiveness of the tools you choose and the ability to conceal them from an observer's view. And, and there's a difference between a trained observer and a casual observer. Right. I'm always amazed at how many people completely miss something. Like when I was still active law enforcement, there were plenty of times where I barely concealed a handgun when I was off duty, either on my way to or from work. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was, you know, very low profile AIWB under a shirt. It would often be the actual holster I wore at work with just, you know, a flannel thrown over whatever I was wearing. And anybody with any sort of training and awareness should have been able to know that I had a pistol on my hip at that point. And I would see police officers that worked for the same agency as me that I didn't know personally, you know, in a store or whatever, if I stopped off on my way to work or from work. And I could tell they weren't aware of the fact that I had a full-size firearm on me. So it, it's not like, it's not the casual observer you're trying to fool, right? You're trying to fool the person who has harmful intent and enough awareness to realize what those tells are, you know, what the printing means, what the way you walk means, how you're holding your body means. And that's the guy you're trying to defeat when you go concealed, right? And in my opinion, you know, EDC should be concealed no matter your status. It doesn't matter if I'm a law enforcement agent, doesn't matter if I'm military working low vis, it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm a, a civilian CCW. I don't want people to know that I have that edge in case I have to employ it. You don't want to be you don't want to be um dealt with proactively by someone with harmful intent in a public place. You don't want them to single you out as the first target because then you're behind the power curve already, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um that's one of the reasons why I like concealing AIWB. It's it's easy to do without printing in a variety of casual clothes. You know, the, the only time it's really a problem is if you're dressed more formally and your concealment is open front. And you have to you have to then shift to like a strong side hip. So that, that's my opinion, at least on placement and kind of the mindset that goes behind it. Like you you need to think about these things, right? It's not just about comfort, although comfort does definitely factor in. It's also about effectiveness. And the effectiveness here, you have to do that kind of that balancing act measuring test between effectiveness of the tools and effectiveness of the concealment. You know, obviously, if you knew you were going to get into a gunfight for your life with high stakes and trained bad guys, you'd probably have a carbine in your hand if you could, but that's not something you can conceal. Mm -hmm. So you have to conceal the best tool. Right. Um, kind of in line with that thinking, most of the time 
I will wear a full size handgun. The vast majority, actually, most of the time, the gun I have on me, AIWB, is actually the one I was showing a second ago, which is a five inch gun. Yeah. Now, nice. yep. Now, granted, I'm I'm tall. I'm six foot three, so that's something I can realistically do. I'm not saying that's something that everyone can realistically do based on climate, how they dress, their body type. You have to determine with that balancing act for you what is the best balance between effectiveness of the firearm and the ability to comfortably and effectively conceal it for long periods of time. And nobody can really answer that but you, and you can't really answer it without going through an experimentation process where you figure that out for yourself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the gun I always carry. Like if I'm, I'm going to be honest, if I'm just going to run to the corner store and I don't want to change out of you know my cargo shorts into something that's more concealable, I might grab a smaller firearm. But that's not for me being out and about all day. That's for like a quick errand out and back. And in my mind, I'm justifying to myself that I can have a slightly less effective tool because of the duration of the trip and where I'm going and the environment I'm in. So th these are also things that, that have to come into play, right? So you have to pick the firearm. That's the first thing you got to do is you got to pick the firearm and your method of concealment. Like I said, I, I really like AIWB for comfort, concealability, and practicality. Um, you know, the old school behind the hip bone carry, it's very hard to get to in a vehicle. Um, your concealment makes your draw much slower than AIWB. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying it's not the right choice in some circumstances, but I don't think it's the most commonly effective concealment method. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I'd have to agree with you. I mean, uh, uh, it, looking at my own progression of carrying a gun for myself, uh, I started where a lot of people do, which is that classic, you know, inside waistband, slightly behind the hip, you know, like four o'clock position <clears throat> and carried there for a lot of years. And, thought that hey yeah that's great works works for me right and uh um for me i see it as uh like everyone has to make the decision for themselves you know weighing all the different factors uh what the, what their lifestyle is like how they dress where they go what they do uh what they think is most important to them uh you know evaluating all those factors combined with what gun can i carry because i think i think most everyone would agree that you're better off carrying as much gun as you can just from like a, a performance and shootability perspective. Right. But there's always, you know, there's trade-offs. So for me, a lot of it was a lack of education and experience with moving to like the appendix position. I mean, I had tried it and uh, the times I had tried it failed miserably at it. And some of that was not, really again not knowing about some of the better quality holster options available because i think when i tried it i tried lower quality lower common denominator stuff and and, and you realize there's quite a bit that goes into the design and engineering and the thought process uh, behind designing quality and comfortable Holster, well, holsters in general, but especially it becomes, I think, even more obvious in the uh, appendix position. Uh, agree? I, I completely agree. Um, yeah. I actually think that's a really important point. It's you need to take as much in your holster selection as you do with your firearm selection, right? And you'll see guys with a very nice, expensive firearm in the cheapest holster they could find that they thought would satisfy the need. And that's not really the answer. I mean, the holster is is very important for your carry. It, it's it can make or break it as far as comfortability, um, safe accessibility to the handgun, safely reholstering the handgun. Like that's where you see a lot of the cheap holsters really fail, is they collapse once you draw the gun, and now you can't safely reholster without using two hands, which is is the wrong answer in the real world. Yeah, so I think holster holster selection is incredibly important for that also. Yeah, yep. You know, just in looking at some comments here on Facebook, uh, I just want to, you know, point out that, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of 
debate, if you will, a lot of different opinionated viewpoints about different carry positions, different holsters. Um, no matter where you carry, holstering should be done carefully, you know, as, as much as possible. I mean, there may be some limited, especially in civilian context, some limited uh, circumstances where holstering needs to be done quickly. But generally speaking, you deal with a situation, you deal with a threat, and when you no longer have a threat and it's safe to do so, reholster, um, you know, as a general rule. And so uh, doing that safely, especially in appendix, absolutely. Um, but it's true no matter where you carry because shooting yourself no matter what, anywhere is it's it's never good. good. It's, it's never, never good. good. <laughs> so always re re reholster safely, carefully, slowly if need be. Um, I just saw one of the comments on the chat here about uh, the grip printing. I'm assuming he means during AIWB. That's the other thing about holster selection is just because you buy the quality holster doesn't mean you're done, right? Yep. I mean, there are things like the holster I use every day, and I wish I'd grabbed it and had it in my office here, but I don't. Um, I use a holster by Weber Tactical. It's called a trifecta. But I've changed it around quite a bit to maximize its effectiveness for me. Um, I added a second discrete carry concepts clip besides the, the one it comes with. Mm -hmm. And I put a foam wedge on the inside. And for people that aren't familiar with wedging up your AIWB holster, it does a bunch of things for you. Um, it increases comfort because you've got foam between you and the muzzle area of the holster. It prevents that printing because what causes that printing is the shape of your body causes the firearm to tilt out away from your abdomen. And that's why you get the magwell area of the grip exposing itself inside a t-shirt. The wedge tilts it back towards your body so that you no longer get that printing effect the same way. Um, the other thing it also does coincidentally is it lowers your chance of flagging something vital when you holster up because it's keeping that muzzle away from your body rather than angled in towards your body. So anybody that's going to carry AIWB, I'd really recommend checking out wedging up the holster. There are pre-made wedges you can get. Um, I use the one from Raven Concealment. It bolts right up to the trifecta. There's also a teardrop shaped wedge with Velcro on the back. I forget who makes it, but it, it's really well done too. Or you can simply get yoga blocks or steal them from your wife or you know, from your yoga studio and cut it up into the wedge shape yourself and then use you know Velcro tape, Velcro with adhesive backing to put on the wedge and on the holster. And if you do it right, it's not, you know, it's not particularly ugly and nobody's going to see it anyway because you're going to be wearing it under your clothes. So comfort is more important. Function is more important than appearance in this case. Form should definitely follow function. Just real quick, Matt, are there, is there anything else that you, you know, that you consider as part of your typical EDC loadout, so to speak? Yep. Um, I have a, a very small flashlight. It's not, you know, I mean, Flashlight technology has come a long way since Surefire were the only guys that had durable and bright flashlights, right? Now you can get pretty decent flashlights at a pretty inexpensive price. Um, I have a, a small stream light that it's very inconspicuous. It's about the size of a pen. Um, it's not the most amount of lumens, but it's very easy to carry comfortably all the time, no matter what I'm wearing. And it gives me a light source for when you're in low light environments, which is, which is crucial. You need to have that. Um, I often carry a knife as well. I don't think that's necessarily mandatory for everyone. I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, I prefer a fixed blade for that. And the reason for that is it can be very difficult for most people to employ a folding knife if they're actually entangled with someone. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually wrapped up with somebody grappling with them, fighting for your life, it can be hard to get that folding knife open unless you've actually trained it against someone who's resistant with a training knife. So fixed blade is easy to employ. You, you simply pull it and it's ready to go. So I like to carry a small fixed blade. Um, and I'm a big believer that if at all possible, you should have a spare magazine for the pistol. Now, and let's examine that, right? So here's the reason for that. Mm -hmm. If you're a civilian, the chances of you needing more than the rounds that your firearm will carry if you choose the right firearm, like the, this one here, I'll typically have the flush fit magazine in it when I carry it. 
And the flush fit magazine for that is 17 rounds plus one in the chamber. So if I need more than 18 rounds going about my daily business in suburban Texas, that's a really bad day. It's not likely to right. happen, right? But having said that, all semi-auto firearms, no matter what the brand, make, model, manufacture, the weakest link in that machine is the magazine, is the source of ammunition. Um, so I carry it almost as much for a backup in case that magazine fails me than for a source of ammo. And I've done that as long as I've carried a gun off duty, as long as I've been carrying a gun concealed since I was a young cop. Because I remember hearing that logic from someone with much more wisdom than me at the time and how that made perfect sense. You know, it's, I mean, and think about your own experience. If you shoot a lot, what is the thing that goes bad the most? Why do we number magazines? Yep. We number magazines because they go bad. They're, they're yeah. expendable items. They don't last forever. You, you want to be able to, to make note of, I just had a malfunction for whatever reason, you know, yep. and you want to be able to start figuring out why that occurred. Which magazine was I using? Oh, number three. Okay. Yep. And then you keep doing your thing, training, practicing, and some other time you maybe have another malfunction. You look down, you check your mag, you're like, oh, number three again. Hmm. <laughs> Might be magazine related. Not the gun, but the mag. Might be. And like I said, that's across the board. Whether yep. you're talking about, you know, Glock, Smith & Wesson, Beretta, Staccato. It's just, that is the weakest part of the mechanical system. And yep. that's universal to the platform you're using. Yeah, you know, and I, I think there's probably a lot of uh, gun owners, frankly, Matt, that uh, aren't aware of the fact that, I mean, you just touched on it, but magazines do, they are uh, they are a wear and tear item. Um, I mean, the magazine body itself can last a long time. Sometimes we do see feed lips and things get, you know, kind of banged up or bent out of shape. But uh, for sure, magazine springs, if you shoot a lot, you're going to be going through, I mean, I, my competition pistol, I replace magazine springs once a year at least. And I'm checking throughout the, the season, depending on how much I'm shooting, you know, just to make sure that the spring, uh, you know, the, the power of those springs, that spring tension is still adequate to keep reliably feeding rounds up into the gun. Oh, a side note on this, the, mm -hmm. uh, the old school wisdom of not keeping your magazines loaded what causes fatigue in that spring is not it being compressed. Yep. What causes fatigue in the spring is the act of compressing, decompressing, compressing, decompressing, that cycle. So the people that used to rotate through magazines and unload them to store them, you're adding one more cycle on the wear. You're not actually doing any good. It's okay to keep them loaded. Uh, I can vouch for that. Absolutely. I've got some mags that have sat loaded for years and still run great. So, um, and I, and you probably could speak to this a little bit too, Matt, that uh, I, I've, you know, from talking to individuals in various uh, positions, whether police or especially military, uh, where they've maybe pulled out mags that have been sitting in an armory or something for or in storage, they were loaded in storage or something for years and years and years. And like almost decades later, you know, they're running those just to see and, and, and things still function just fine. No, absolutely. It's like I said, it's the movement, it's the compression and decompression that causes the stress on the metal, not remaining compressed. And it's just, it's science, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Materials engineering. Um, cool. That's a, uh, that's really good stuff. Um, you talked about doing a needs analysis and, and, and we've kind of basically in, in talking about what and how we carry as far as the equipment's concerned, that in and of itself is a needs analysis, right? Yes, absolutely. But, you know, let's, let's kind of sh apply that a little bit more to the, um, you know, needs analysis as far as from like a training or a performance perspective. But before we do, I forgot, I have a question from a listener we wanted to uh, ask you that I hit you up about earlier. And this one has to do with uh, body armor, right? So we're talking about EDC uh, gear or equipment. And, uh, and it seems that this becomes more, that this is becoming more and more of a topic amongst everyday, you know, Joes and Janes out there on the street, you know, seeing what's going on in society sometimes, seeing what happened this last year with riots and protests and whatnot. 
Um, but the question from a listener is, how realistic is the use of body armor from the perspective of an everyday concealed carrier? And then a second uh, you know, question attached to that, what, if anything, do you or would you change about your tactics or shooting when you don't have body armor? And of course, Matt, in your profession, you wore body armor a lot. Yes. So there's, there's a couple things you have to realize here, right? Is that body armor is not what it appears to be in popular media, right? Something that's going to stop truly powerful rounds, rifle rounds, is going to be hard armor, not soft armor with the technology we have now, unless you have a, a very high budget. I mean, Elon Musk might be able to get some better stuff than that, but the average person's not going to be able to. None of it is truly covert. So there's a difference between low profile, low vis, and covert, right? And those are military terms, but you have to think about it in that sense. There were plenty of times where I would be low vis with either soft armor or even hard armor, but it wasn't meant to stand up to an inspection at arm's length. It was meant to make me look like I wasn't a combatant from a distance, which is the difference, right? Anytime I have ever in either profession tried to appear like I was completely harmless, you know, tried to be like truly covert, I would ditch the armor because even the softest, lightest armor that's available commercially right now, someone who knows what they're looking for when they're close to you will know you're wearing body armor. And I know they wear, they sell clothing now that has some sort of, you know, ballistic resistant properties to it. I don't know what the rating on that would be. And there's some things people need to take into consideration there too. Um, the way soft armor works is soft armor needs to be against your body firmly for it to have its full resistance to ballistic impact. That's how it actually functions, right? If you just hung it from a clothespin, like on somebody's old, you know, old laundry line from back before we had appliances and shot it, it's not going to have the same ballistic properties because there's nothing behind it keeping that fabric firm across it. It's kind of the same theory as like a, a drum, right? A drum, the, the surface of a drum is fabric. It's, it's leather. It's some sort of, you know, fabric-like substance depending on who makes the drum, whatever, I'm not a musician, but it's stretched taut across the body of the drum. And that's how it gives you that sound when you hit it with the drumstick, right? Because it's got that tension making it different than when it's loose. If you hit that same fabric hanging loose, you're not going to get that drum beat. It's not going to be resistant to that impact. It's going to move. So if the ballistic stuff moves when it gets shot, it's not going to, it's not going to resist the bullet the same way. Which is why I think that, you know, with current technology, like the John Wick fantasy of the, the suit that stops bullets, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is something out there that I haven't been exposed to. But in my experience, there's nothing that's going to actually protect you in that sense. Armor is uncomfortable to wear. Even, even comfortable soft armor in hot temperatures is going to get sweaty and nasty by the end of the day. You know, ask, ask any policeman, you know, wearing... Wearing soft armor in the summertime can be hot. It can be very uncomfortable and it's stiff. It doesn't conform to your body like regular fabric, um, much less plates. You know, you're not, you're not going to consider plates. It's just not going to happen. Yep. So I, I don't think it's realistic currently, unless you're in a very, very high threat environment to wear body armor as an EDC. And if you do wear it as an EDC, anyone who's trained or even just observant is going to see that something's up. Yep. Yep. That, that's for sure. You know, you and I were talking beforehand about, you know, I've got some fairly low pro profile stuff, which I think is rated 2A, which, you know, is supposed to stop your typical handgun rounds, 9mm, 40, 45, 380, so forth. Um, but uh, even for as low profile as it is, and I have worn it. So, I, and I've done some security type work where that, you know, that's was, that was the whole reason I acquired it was for low lower profile security um, type situations and uh, but again if if you're interacting with somebody closely or you know within a certain distance of them like if they're if they're paying enough attention they'll be able to still figure out you're wearing some armor the only the only other way I, I would say is if you're wearing enough layers over top you know a jacket a hoodie you know that kind of thing so I could see that kind of you know thing working but but again it's warm 
So, you know, you start talking about adding layers on top of even low profile armor, you get warm very fast. And even that in and of itself could be a tell, Hey, this dude's sweating really hard. Like what's going on? <laughs> yeah. I, I just don't think it's practical with today's technology. <laughs> Yeah. It may not be that far off when it is. And there may be stuff out there for the very high-end user that has a lot of money. Maybe there is that I haven't experienced. But the stuff I've seen, I wouldn't consider it an ETC item. That doesn't mean you can't put it in your vehicle. If you're yep. concerned about things and you want to have it staged in your vehicle, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as far as tactics, that was the second part of the question. Yep. I had a tactics yep. change. I'm going to act the exact same way whether I have armor on or not because either way I don't really want to get shot. Mm -hmm. uh, just like people talk about uh, nothing is truly waterproof. It's just water resistant. Nothing is truly bulletproof either. It's just bullet resistant. Um, despite the ratings, despite everything else, it's you don't want to get shot even with the armor. It's just you want to avoid taking hits from incoming rounds whenever possible, no matter what you're wearing. Yep. Well, it still hurts, and uh, I haven't I haven't experienced that personally. I don't know if you have, but uh, but I know it still hurts, and uh, it also still only covers a certain percentage of your body. Yep. And when it's struck, it's damaged. It's not you know, it's not a superhero movie. It's not gonna gonna bounce off from the same place over and over and over again. Every time it takes a hit, it takes damage. So you want to minimize that from a practical standpoint as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I concur. I, 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 you know, even in my time going through <clears throat> law enforcement training, the academy, doing stuff on the street, like I never once had the thought of, well, I'm going to do this differently because I'm wearing armor versus not or vice versa. Because like to your point, nobody wants to get shot, period. So tactics should remain the same i also wanted to, i just uh talking about um tactics a little bit kind of going back to where we sort of started and you you kind of talked about being concealed and, and remaining concealed and concealing not for necessarily the casual observer but but for the the trained observer and i don't feel like we really hit on this i mean it's certainly been a topic on the podcast before but but when we talk about trained observers it's not just like people might tend to think, Oh, we're talking about police officers or, Sorry, you know, that no. kind of thing. No, 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 no. We're talking about some of the worst of the worst criminals are more trained, whether it be in unconventional methods or, uh, you know, they've obtained their training in, in unconventional ways, but they're, they're still what you'd consider a trained observer, right? Absolutely. It and that training, like nobody goes to a course that I'm aware of. It'd be cool if there was one out there. But like when I was in the academy, I didn't get a block of instruction on how to visually determine the person with a firearm on them, right? That's something you gain through experience. Well, the bad guys get experience too. And a lot of these guys are operating in neighborhoods and environments where they survive based on their awareness of potential threats and like pre-threat cues. So they get that same experiential training about you know, printing and the way it changes the way you walk and everything else. And it may not even be conscious. It may be something that's subconscious for them, you know, but through that experience, many of them gain that too and can tell when you're carrying. So that's something you want to watch out for, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I just wanted to go back and hit on that again. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure somebody listening is going to write into the podcast, you know, saying, you guys, you know, don't, don't believe in or support open carry. And it's not that at all. I support the, uh, the right. Absolutely. But this is the concealed carry podcast after all. And tactically speaking to your point that you made earlier on, uh, talking about not wanting people to know what you have available to you as, as far as tools. Um, one of the oldest tactics in the book is the element of surprise. So, um, yeah, it has it has value and it has merit. And also you have to evaluate open carry from your operational environment as well, right? And that's something that there's yep. a difference between evaluating something based on your constitutional right and based on the actual operational environment and your desired in state, right? 
So when you're caring, what is your desired end state? If you're simply, you know, making making a visible support of the Second Amendment and you're willing to take the acceptable tactical risks, that's a different thing. That's a different desired end state than saying, I want to put on this gun and protect myself and my family as efficiently as possible. And I'm not saying the other end state is wrong. I'm just saying it's a different end state. You're yep. looking at different things, different criteria, right? So if you want to stack the deck in your favor, then you want to make sure that you're well concealed because that way you are not perceived as a threat prior to the initiation of hostilities, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to look at it like uh, culturally as well, right? So if we were in a culture where enough people carried open, like say we were back in the days of the Wild West, that changes things. Then yep. you're no longer being singled out because you have a pistol on your hip, right? You might be singled out because you didn't you have might. a pistol. You might, right. <clears throat> but that's a different set of criteria and circumstances than realistically what we can expect in today's world. And you can get into you know political and philosophical debates about what we should expect and what you want the world to be like. So work to change the world, but that doesn't change the way the world is now. And right now, if you're walking around open carry, you are giving up a significant tactical advantage and you are making yourself kind of the target of a few things, not necessarily just overt hostility, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And to the point of, you know, I, I wouldn't mind hearing your perspective on this as well, but uh, to the point of you know, people sometimes make the, the, the argument that open carry would be a deterrent to criminals or to becoming a victim of a crime. Mm -hmm. and, and I, the way I'd answer that first off is that with some criminals, it may very well likely make be a deterrent, but with some certain other criminals, it might not. I think that, and this goes back to cultural, right? <clears throat> so if our culture was such that a significant enough number of people carried openly, that would be a deterrent to crime in public, absolutely. But that's not the culture we're in now. You know, that's yep. that's simply not it. Um, oh, talking about EDC, I just saw a comment pop up. Right. Yeah. So about a tourniquet. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I think I think having a med kit is very important. Um, I personally stage a med kit in my vehicle. Like I have a full med kit in the vehicle. I don't carry one on my person these days. There were plenty of times in my careers where I did carry like a small med kit in a pocket on my person. Um, it's far more likely for me right now to be able to access that from my vehicle if I truly need it, right? Um, I don't see myself realistically as a retiree who's now a, a civilian carrier, basically. I don't see myself realistically as putting a tourniquet on under fire that's statistically very low probability for me. I'm not saying you're wrong for carrying one. If you want to carry one, it's not a bad idea at all. Um, medical stuff is extremely important without a doubt. Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, again, this goes back to the whole needs analysis and, and approach of what, of, of what is, I mean, like we all have to make that decision for ourselves of what we, what's important to us um, in order of priority. Um, and how, you know, what, what our plan A is, but also our plan B and our plan C and so forth. Um, I mean, I don't carry a tourniquet on me every day, everywhere I go. Are there times I do have a tourniquet on me? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll tell you, I've always got one usually within arm's length as far as my commonly go-to places, meaning I have my backpack, goes with me from home, goes with me to the office, is right there, you know, alongside with me pretty much wherever I go. Uh, just from a perspective of I'm going places, going to meetings, going to work, and I'm taking my laptop or iPad with me, or, you know, and I've got a full, full IFAC uh, right there with me in the bag. Uh, well, and that kind of goes into like the blowout bag philosophy, right? And and this is something that the military does, at least the military units I was in, does a lot better than law enforcement does. But it's definitely applicable both to law enforcement and to the civilian populace, right? Like you can what if what you need to the point where you have enough stuff to fill an Alice large rucksack, right? Yep. And it gets really difficult to carry all of that efficiently on your person. 
But having a small backpack that's commonly near you, you know, whether you're traveling and it's, it's near you or whether it's in your vehicle, you know, that's a really good idea. And that's where you can have more magazines. You can have extensive medical supplies. You can have all those things that you might need in an outlier incident, but the frequency of need doesn't offset the uncomfortability and difficulty of carrying it concealed and covertly. Yep. 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 Um, I told you we were going to talk about needs analysis more from a training and or performance perspective. Uh, so, so let's kind of shift gears into that now. Um, so you, in your article, uh, you do a great job of, well, I picked up on, on a, a bit of a theme. You, you sort of talked about training like an athlete versus working out, just working out. And, and that kind of came through in a couple different places in your article. Uh, and applying it to concealed carriers or to shooters, you know, defensive minded folk, um, you know, same thing would apply, right? Like when we go to the range, excuse me, what do we go to the range for? Are we there to just burn through 250 rounds of ammo? Cause that's what we do once per week. Maybe not these days, but so, some maybe, I don't know, but uh, you know, do we, do we go and we go and we always shoot through the same standard uh, uh, same drills every time or we, you know, go through two boxes of just slow fire accuracy work. I mean, whatever it is, like, it's pretty easy for a lot of people to get into some sort of routine. Um, and routines aren't bad by, in, you know, in and of themselves, right? Uh, in fact, routines can be a very valuable tool. But, you know, over time, needs change. And over time, my growth or my... Uh, you know, increase in performance or whatever changes. And, 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 you know, I get, you know, better at things that I used to be not so good at now, other things maybe become more of a, a priority. So, so I wanted to, you to kind of touch on this as a, this, a, this, the, the importance of a needs analysis and applying that into a training plan uh, because that implies that we're going, we're training, we're practicing with a purpose in mind, with an end goal in mind, right? Yeah, what you need to do is you have to figure out for you what the skill level you need is, right? And that's, that's a more complex question than it might seem. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's my most likely encounter? What is the most dangerous encounter that I am maybe only marginally likely to face, but it's still a possibility, right? And you have to kind of decide for yourself how good is good enough. And we could go on about that for a long time. Yep. But once you decide that, that's your desired end state for your training is that particular skill level. And you have to, you have to see what you need right now to chip away at your inefficiencies, your weaknesses, make them better to get closer to that desired end state. And that's, it's a moving target. It changes all the time. Yep. So you have to kind of set up a feedback loop in your training so that you're figuring out what you need to work on. I said, but the very, the very first thing you should do when you're designing your training program for shooting if you should sit down and list metrics, these are the skills I need and these are the performance metrics I need to have on them. And they've got to be objectable. They've got to be quantifiable. They've got to be objective, not objectionable, objective. So, <laughs> um, it, it's got to be data driven, right? So like, let's take it, let's take an example. Um, we'll take the draw, right? And now here's the thing about the draw, in my opinion, for, a CCW individual, okay, is that it's actually a not a common thing that you're going to need that sub-second draw from concealment. Because if, what's more important is your awareness of knowing what's going on and pre-staging yourself to be ready for the conflict, right? Yep. So if you need that sub-second draw without your hand already on the gun or without you know any prep mentally, you're already kind of a little bit behind the power curve. So that tells you two things, right? Is that if I'm doing everything else right, if I'm doing my job as someone who carries a gun, and by job, I don't mean the way you make your money. I mean, it's that's your task. If you're carrying that gun in public, your job is to be aware of what's going on, right? Otherwise, it's just a fashion accessory. So if you're doing that part of the task correctly, you probably will not need that fast draw from concealment. But... 
if you do need it, you're really going to need it. It's like a reserve parachute. You might not ever need it, but when you do, you have the rest of your life to sort it out, however long that is. So you want to be really good at it. Um, the other thing, in my opinion, that the draw does for us is I think the draw is the best way to develop an index. And an index is not only a high frequency skill you'll need, it is arguably the highest frequency skill you need. Because the most important thing in a close on gunfight is being the first guy to put an effective hit on the other guy. Because the first one to put an effective hit on the other person almost invariably wins, right? So the way you do that, that speed of presentation and acquiring a target is by developing a proper index. And for those of you who don't know that are listening in, like an index is the ability to look at a point and then bring the weapon so that the sights are aligned on that point ready to shoot subconsciously and rapidly. Would you agree with that definition, Riley? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the draw is the best way to develop the index. So you're kind of getting more bang for your buck than just the draw itself, right? But then, like, say your needs analysis says, well, you know, if in your mind you're okay with only having, like, a comfortably competent safe draw and you think that's all you will need only you can answer that like only you can say what you're going to be willing to put yourself into in a situation right mm -hmm. but i would argue that to truly be competent at this you do want that sub-second draw and by sub-second draw everybody realizes we're talking about the standard is usually an open target the size of a person at seven yards getting an acceptable hit on that which in my mind, so I, I categorize this three ways, right? You have optimal, acceptable, unacceptable. So optimal would be like that fist sized group in the high center chest, but acceptable would be the majority of the torso, right? So putting around in that majority of the torso, not on the edge, but you know, the majority of that mass in under a second from seven yards is pretty much the accepted standard, I think. Um, and you get to points where like, you know, guys want it in that fist sized group in under a second, which is good because now you're building that that buffer of skill in to counteract performance degradation under stress. Yep. So, so say we've decided that like that's going to be our standard. So if that's our standard on that skill, and we agree that we need that skill for a variety of reasons, not just its frequency of use. So then that, that informs our training. Now I go back and I'm like, okay, I need to dry fire my draw from concealment. And if I want my live fire draw to be on demand, cold, no matter my stress level at a second or better, then what does it need to be in dry fire? You know, do I need to go 0.7 for it to translate to live fire? You have to kind of play around with that a little bit, right? But the idea is your training should be designed to achieve those desired in-state goals, those metrics that you set up for yourself. And you have to kind of look at this as it's not every metric is going to take the same amount of work or the same kind of work. Um, the draw is a skill that you can teach someone pretty quickly. It doesn't take a long time to get somebody down to under a second. Um, a little longer from concealment, but it's it's something that it's a relatively simple skill. It doesn't mean it's easy. Simple isn't always easy, right. but it's relatively simple. Like if you look at reloads from concealment compared to draws from concealment, reloads are much more complex, much higher incident rate of failure, you know, it's, it's a much more difficult skill to get down to the same time. So you're probably not going to have to prioritize your draw and training to achieve that goal as much as you'll have to prioritize your reloads and training. So that's going to inform your practice too. You know, how much time do I spend on each individual skill based on what it will take to get me there? And there are some skills, some metrics that you're not even going to be able to work on until you get others done. So Take a Blake drill. So a Blake drill is an exercise in target transitions. I have three torso size targets at seven yards. I'm putting two rounds from the draw on each of those targets, right? Well, splits are something else that are going to kind of just come relatively quickly. Splits will come to your comfortable level of performance. Now to get them faster, takes a lot of work, but to get them fast enough to have that little bit of buffer, so you can split it 0.25 to 0.2 in the real world isn't going to take as much work as it is to like really grind them down and get them faster, mm -hmm. right? Transitions though, are going to take more work than splits. 
to transition efficiently from target to target is going to take a lot more practice than getting that split down. Because the split, a lot of it is just wanting to track the sites in recoil, get that site video as opposed to a site picture. Whereas transitions, there's a lot more going on. I'm driving my eyes to the next target. I have to make sure I drive them to precisely the point I want them to be at. I have to teach my body to subconsciously bring the gun rapidly and efficiently without using too much muscle to be in line with my eyes, that index again. So if I'm going to use Blake drills to build my transitions, and my gold standard is I want my transitions at that particular target array to equal my splits, which is the gold standard. That's something I can't even begin to chip away on until my draw is efficient to develop that index until I've developed those splits. You see what I mean? Like I can't even really put any real work on that yet. That's going to come a little bit later. And that's a simple example of how your training changes. But in the beginning, you know, you're not going to work on transitions until you're safely drawing rapidly until you're, you know, you're safely developing that index. Then I can start working on transitions and start working on those things in other other contexts that makes sense yeah no it absolutely does and and, and that's you know when, when we when we approach this from the angle of a developing or progressing shooter <clears throat> over time that's why things change right and so we got to be constantly updating and adapting and improving or changing our our training plans to meet what our current needs are so that we're being efficient, especially in this day and age with ammo being the way it is like right now, like that's the, that's the quite, that, that's what I'm faced with as someone that is trying to like you, Matt, go to the next level as far as shooting, meaning, you, you know, you're master class shooter. You want to, you want to be grandmaster. Uh, you know, you've talked about that goal. Um, I, I'd like to work towards that as well. And, but with ammo the way it is, it's like I got to get a lot. I got to get a lot of work done, but I got to get it done more efficiently than I have in the past, because I can't just go and willy nilly. You know, I mean, the one thing that I'm not able to do as much as I have in the past is, you know, in the past I've I've done drills akin to like a bill drill, a lot. You know, that's one of the reasons why I do. I think I do have pretty good recoil control, and I do have pretty good splits. And I can maintain control of that gun at a high rate of speed because I've practiced that a lot. But you have I, better than pretty good splits. You've got you've got a happy trigger finger. Yeah, I, I like I like going fast. Uh, you know, so you know, in the past that was more more doable. Going to the range and dumping five or six hundred rounds, and you know, three hundred of that is just recoil focused uh, practice or drills. You know. Uh, can't do that as at least as much anymore so got to be a lot more efficient and uh I'm, I'm playing around a lot more just just with testing some recoil stuff matt with you know doing kind of like a doubles type uh approach with recoil uh, control and really really just being uber observant of what i'm seeing going on in the gun over two rounds instead of over six you know maybe we do one or two build drills per practice session but then everything else is is a lot more controlled and measured and le and lower round count. This actually comes around kind of a little bit full circle too, if you think about it. So you're talking about being more aware during the recoil arc, right? Yeah. Which is incredibly important to be a high level shooter. That is not something you can even work on when someone first starts shooting. You you just can't. Yep. Their eyes aren't educated enough to see it, their brains aren't even going to understand really the concept yet of how, like, like I remember I first got this from Frank Proctor where he said you should be able to see the brass tumble out of the ejection port. That's how tuned into the gun you should be in recoil. And I remember at the time, like, kind of <laughs> it made me think, right? And now that I'm further along in my, my practice and my shooting, like that's that's what I'm always striving for. Is I want to know exactly what that gun is doing at every point of the recoil arc. Like I, I should be able to paint a picture with words of exactly where that dot of that front sight went. I should be able to see. I should be able to pick out which piece of brass it was on the ground from watching the arc as it had lifted and went out of the ejection port. Right? That's the level of awareness you need to have in every repetition for it to be truly effective at increasing your performance. 
And that awareness itself is a skill. And it's a skill you have to develop, especially because it's not natural to have this miniature explosion going off in front of your face, right? So yeah. I mean, that that has to be overcome too. Um, another yeah. example, like we're talking about, you know, speed of splits, right? Like something I'm really putting a lot of emphasis on for myself in my dry fire training is feeling exactly how much pressure I let off for the reset. Right. And that's like, this is not something that you're going to talk to somebody who's in their first few years of shooting about. Like you're, you're just not the most you're going to get along is telling them to make sure that they let off the trigger during recoil and are ready to, you know, take up the slack again by the time the sights settle. But I've actually been like in my dry fire training, pull up the gun again. So clear gun. So in my dry fire training, I'm I'm actually trying to feel that piece after the hammer falls. So when the hammer falls, rather than do this and have no pressure on the trigger, whether I'm whether I, I exaggerated it, right? But you know, I, I left contact with the trigger to exaggerate it. Yep. What I really want to do is I want to learn just that, just back to the wall again. And that's something I've really been trying to feel both in live fire and dry fire. And obviously in dry fire, it's a little bit different because the hammer is forward. So the trigger is not quite the same feel, but the trigger on my pistol does still move the same distance, whether the hammer is forward or back. And I can play around with it. And then I validate it in live fire to see if I'm doing it the right way. Right. And that, like, that kind of little thing, like, for me, that's now low-hanging fruit. For most people in their first few years of shooting, that's not something they should even be thinking about. The most they should be thinking about, like I said, is not pinning the trigger to the rear and letting it reset during recoil. But trying to actually train your finger so that it's, it's back at the wall again, precisely, is something that I wouldn't even tell somebody who didn't have, you know, years of shooting at a pretty high level under their belt to even think about yet. Yep. And that's an example of how your training changes yep. over time. I want to touch on real quick about <clears throat> kind of the, the mindset, if you will, of, of training. I think uh, you're frozen on my end. Um, I hope you still have me. Sitting there. Okay, hey, there we are. Okay, technical difficulties there. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if I froze on your end, but you froze on mine. So I think you know, I think I had a little a little blip in my uh, internet connection here. So I apologize for that. I think we got it figured out. <laughs> Forgot to pay the internet bill again. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, fortunately it's not that. Okay. So, uh, back to where I was. Um, so, so the one thing I wanted to kind of touch on Matt was, uh, the, uh, sort of this segue, if you will, into your article that you titled math, which is, I think really interesting thing to talk about, but I, I see these two pieces as, as kind of going together in a way. And, and the way I make this connection for myself is, is that I should be viewing my approach as much as possible um, in how I carry, you know, my, my approach to my gear, my EDC, my training, but also how I'm preparing myself mentally for the, the I won't say inevitable, but, but it, you know, 
because we certainly it's still these are rare occurrences and we certainly hope this doesn't happen to anybody but if if the worst day of my life occurs meaning the day that my life is in jeopardy and i have to potentially take someone else's life to prevent that um that that's going to be a really crappy day so i my approach i want to be from as much of a professional perspective or approach as possible um because I mean, if we look at this whole needs analysis and and you know approaching your training appropriately, at least in a way that's going to get us the biggest gain, like what we see, I think in in professional sports is what separates truly the professionals from your amateurs is the professionals train and practice like it's their job because it is, and the amateurs, well, it's it's a hobby, and so you know they do some things well. And they do some things right as far as practicing, but it's not a job. And so it's less professional. And I'm not saying that everyday, you know, typical concealed carriers have to be a professionals and it, that, you know, because this isn't going to be your job. It isn't like you're fitting concealed carry into your existing lifestyle and you already have your professional careers and your jobs and your families and everything else to take care of. However, Carrying a gun for personal defense is a big, big, big responsibility. And it has to be approached and taken seriously. So I, 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 in other words, I think we as more casual concealed carriers can learn a lot from a professional's approach to the way they would approach this. Um, and especially in that that mental preparation uh, side of things as well, because it's that I think that's incumbent upon us as responsible concealed carriers is to have the right mindset. If we're going to be, uh, be faced with deadly force. Yep. And I, I think this is kind of twofold, right? Yeah. So the, there's two things that kind of go into play here. Um, and I'll talk about the simpler one first. So, and first off, like, I don't think you train mindset on the range. Like your practice sessions on the range shooting aren't going to be what develop the proper mindset. It's a separate issue. Um, that's one of the reasons why, like, when people when people do all these kind of range theatrics where they're trying to simulate being in a fight when they're shooting at targets, I don't think that's the most effective way to train. I think if you're going to train shooting, you should simply train the shooting. Um, mindset is developed uh, to a large degree just simply in how you live your life. Um, you have to put yourself in situations where you have to perform under stress and the stakes, at least to you personally, are high. And that's how you kind of develop that piece of your mindset, right? Like you don't, you don't do it on the flat range. Um, now, having said that, I do think what you need to do is you need to prepare yourself for what could potentially happen, right? Because there is a psychological cost of not being prepared before the event happens. And the way you want to look at it, and this accomplishes a couple of things for you, actually. It's very good from a legal standpoint because there's always the fight after the fight, right? If you have to use deadly force against someone, you're going to have to have some sort of legal action following it. It may be minor. It may be a full-blown trial. But something is going to happen, and you're going to have to deal with that, right? So this actually helps you there as well. It makes your actions more defensible. But maybe even more importantly, this is how you avoid the psychological cost of doing violence to another person, right? You should set in your mind well ahead of time what the parameters are. You know, if, if someone does this, then I'm going to respond with deadly force. And that should be both legally and ethically justifiable to you, your own personal moral structure, as well as the laws of wherever you're at. And then once you set those criteria in your head and understand that once that happens, it's simply math. That's why I titled the article that, the blog post that. Then you're taking that, you're not taking the decision-making process away from yourself. Like you're still making the right decisions, but what you're doing is you're taking that ethical decision off of yourself. You did not decide to create that situation where the other person needed to have deadly force used against them. That was their choice. 
And if you work all that out in your head ahead of time, you'll avoid a lot of emotional anguish and stress. And also, it will be much easier to articulate and defend your actions if you have to legally. Yes, I drew my pistol and I fired because the other person did this. And I knew that would be a direct threat of either death or great bodily harm to myself. Right. So you kind of work that yeah. out ahead of time. Now, the other part of mindset, you know, people and it aggravates me a lot because I see a lot of people who perhaps their shooting skills are subpar justify this by talking about how they train mindset and they train fighting and you know therefore somehow their mindset is like the force and they'll be able to overcome their skill level they've developed through training and do jedi tricks and make it through no relation to scott jedlinski other jedi <laughs> um you know so here's the problem with that right if mindset was some sort of magical panacea, you know, if it was like key or the force and you could do magic tricks like a, like a Hong Kong movie because you had mindset, maybe, but that's not how mindset works, right? At all. And the people who are the most in harm's way, arguably of any profession in the world, you know, you talk about your, your SMU operators in the military, routinely seek out training from high-level competitive shooters. So if mindset and tactics overcame mediocre shooting, why are they doing that? Yeah, Because they're trying to stack the deck in their favor, and mindset and tactics do not overcome mediocre skill, right? Yep. And we're actually doing ourselves, in my opinion, a disservice when we try to train mindset on the range. When we have these elaborate... PT routines that we do when we shoot and we have these, you know, dramatic range theatrics where we're looking in 57 different directions and, you know, screaming out commands and all of this stuff. All of that needs to be trained separately from the shooting. When it's time to learn to shoot, learn to shoot and learn to shoot at a very high level. You know, your shooting drives your tactics. All the tactical knowledge in the world, all the mindset in the world is not going to overcome your inability to put hit on target rapidly, accurately, under pressure with a low incident rate of failure. That's what's going to get yeah. you the ability to use your mindset, right? Yeah. And I mean, you can argue that you can use mindset to avoid a fight, and that is correct. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about once the fighting starts, you better be able to shoot. And that's just the bottom line. Um you also aren't going to train mindset through range theatrics because it's it's a drill to go back to like Bruce Lee. I think we talked about Bruce Lee the other time I was on the podcast. Yeah. Um, he talked about techniques and training methods being either alive or dead, right? And what he meant by that was context. If you're trying to train mindset on the range through theatrics, that's dead. There's no context. There's no, it's not real to you. It's not visceral, Right. You need to train mindset into something that's putting you under the right amount of stress. Um, and it's separate from your shooting. It doesn't mean it can't involve shooting. Those like PT sessions in the shooting or like going to a match and shooting. That's all valuable because you are testing yourself under stress at the skill you already developed. But you're not training your skills with the mindset. You're training the mental part of the game then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't help but my thoughts went to the com the competitive world a little bit. Uh, I was thinking about, um, f for me, a lot of my current ability to perform in a match. Like, the, yes, the shooting is being tested there. That's that's without a doubt. But there's nothing more I can do. Um, like I'm at the match. I'm not there to work on getting better as a shooter. I'm there to actually just perform and see if all the work I've put in up to that point is good enough in terms of the performance aspect. Almost everything else for me going to a match, especially a major match, is like it's all a mental game. Yep. And and so in a way, you know, I I, I went to five major matches last year this year i plan to go to about five major matches love to do more but that's pretty much what the schedule permits <clears throat> and for me at least right now so like I, I, you tell me if i'm getting off track with anything and i'd love to hear kind of 
what you would take away from what I'm adding here. But I, I'm just looking at Sterling's comment as well on Facebook about how to train or, you know, for mindset, that kind of thing. For me, it's uh, going to these matches from a mental aspect is more of a training for me on, on the mental side of, of the equation um, because it's all about like keeping myself in the, in the appropriate headspace to not get in my own way and affect my performance negatively. Now I know that may not necessarily translate to a gunfight, but um, I want to actually, before I hand it back to Michael, back over to you, I want to actually quote from your article that this was probably the thing that stood out to me the most as like a big takeaway for just about any concealed carrier. And, and some of this comes because I just came across a news story a few days ago of a, uh, a man that was involved in a road rage incident and he's a concealed carrier and had a gun with him and everything, but things got totally blown out of proportion and way out of hand. And of course he's facing charges now because he drew his gun and pointed it at people, um, you know, in in this, in this incident. Uh, And the only thing I can think of looking at a story like that is that, he allowed his emotions to control him, right? And so what I was going to quote from your article here was looking at conflict this way and referring to the mathematical equation type, you know, aspect and both ensures that you act, that you act ethically and avoids much of the negative emotional response that can follow the use of deadly force. The decision was his, not yours. Math, pure and simple dispassionate and void of anger or hatred and it's anger and hatred and frustration all those negative emotions that gets people in trouble on the legal and ethical side of the equation where it comes to use of deadly force and it kills performance it absolutely kills performance and that was the other link (laughs) yep no absolutely and Mm -hmm. it's this actually will will segue really well. I just looked at Sterling's question too. This will actually circle around and segue really well into answering that, right? So when you're in a fight, the moment you get angry, you're if the other guy's good, you're done. You've lost. And all fighting is at its heart the same, right? Fighting is imposing your will, whether from a position of, of ethical correctness or not, imposing your will on another individual. The tools, the medium you use to impose your will are what makes it a fist fight or a knife fight or a gun fight or a thermonuclear warfare for that matter, right? All human conflict is mentally at its heart the same. How many times have you seen, whether we're talking about a political debate or a boxing match or warfare, how many times have you seen one opponent intentionally anger the other one in order to diminish their skill and ability to respond? Mm-hmm. It happens all the time. Yep. Right? Guys will play these games to get inside the other person's head. It, leaders of countries will do it, right? Because if the other person is acting from a position of anger and that is informing their decisions or fear and that is informing their decisions, they have lost the ability to truly function at their optimal level right off the bat, right? And this kind of segues into what. Sterling is asking, he's asking about what kind of exercises and training do you recommend for mindset? So this is something that's a little more complex, right? Especially because most civilians don't have, I I had the good fortune of having two careers that I did a lot of force of force training in. Like, you know, I've got, I don't know how many hours of force on force training, either as an instructor or a student participant, you know, role player, good guy, bad guy, all kinds of things. Right. So, this helps huge and there are places you can seek this out as a civilian but it's much harder to do but if you can i would absolutely do it because the lessons you learn are invaluable it's the only place you can spar with a gun right yep. so that's really important but really just as important as that is you've got to develop all these different kind of pillars of your mindset right so calmness under stress and following the the process of shooting despite your emotions and your mental state matches, 
that piece of it matches give you so huge, like, like so much better than anything else. And um, and we've talked about it before, so I don't want to go into it at length again, but you know, matches for me are more stressful than a gunfight. And I'm not the only one that says that. So that tells you something right there. Right. But that's not all of it because even though the match is stressful, it is still a static course against static targets, right? It's not the same as an opponent who's actually thinking and reacting and fighting back against you. Okay. So for that, Force on force, wherever you can get it, absolutely. But any sort of combative endeavor where you're working against a resisting opponent, whether it's BJJ, whether it's boxing, whether it's Muay Thai, any of that is worth doing, Just you know, whatever your skill level, whatever your physical ability, whatever your skill level, because we're talking about mindset here, right? That ability to remain calm in a fight and use your tools that you have, your attributes, your abilities that you have, at their utmost, you need to put yourself in that sort of situation, right? And that's going to help you huge. It's enormous benefits, right? So that's number two. The third pillar that I would say for mindset is just will, right? And will and discipline, because it's really self-discipline and will are kind of the same thing when you get right down to it. Will is like more projected out and self-discipline is projected in, but it's the same mental attribute, same emotional attribute. How do you develop will and self-discipline? By putting yourself in situations that require it. Um, there's a reason why selection pipelines for special operations units aren't about the shooting. They can teach you how to shoot if you're the right person. The pipelines are about will and self-discipline because that's what it takes to have that kind of a job, right? And physical attributes too, but that's we're not talking about that right now. So, yeah, I mean, you know... It's not your career. It's not, you know, that's not what you're doing for a living. That's fine. You don't have to go to that extreme. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to join the army at at 45 and go to selection (laughs) so I can be a better concealed carry holder. No, that's, you don't have to do that. But there are plenty of outlets for that. Find something that's going to test you mentally and make you stronger. And the more of that you do, the stronger you become mentally. So mindset is really something you're working on in everything you do. Um, go back to the whole martial arts thing, right? You know, like, uh, that's what they, all the, like the greats always wrote about that. Like everything you do is training. Everything you do is training for something. What are you training yourself for? Mm. Mm. That's excellent, man. I think that's probably a pretty good place to, to wrap it up. Um, other than I, I had one, one final thought that I meant to touch on and, and forgot, uh, going back to where you talked about mindset, not and tactics, not being able to overcome poor, you know, skills or shooting ability. Um, I was thinking how backwards that is because if anything, it's it's the opposite way, right? Yeah. Where you know, as you can as you continue to develop better and better performance skills it actually reinforces that hopefully already existing strong, you know, mental fortitude and mindset and all that. Right. Well, confidence is a huge part of it. Yeah. If you're confident in your skills, you can remain calm in the conflict. Um, And that applies whether, you know, whether you wind up in a fist fight, but you've been going to BJJ every Tuesday and Thursday for the last five years. And, you know, you get jumped by a guy in the Costco parking lot, like Elke said a minute ago on Sunday. In the comments. Yeah, I wouldn't go to Costco on Sunday either. No, I'm not brave enough for that. That's that's some serious stuff right there. But anyway, you know, so you wind up in that hypothetical fist fight in the parking lot of Costco because, you know, you accidentally scuffed the guy's car with your, your shopping cart, right? Mm-hmm. If you've been rolling every Tuesday and Thursday night for the last five years, you're going to be pretty confident. And that's going to enable you to remain calm and not have that emotionally driven response. You have to be dispassionate and the skills have to happen subconsciously so that you can make the decisions consciously. That's why we need subconscious skill because the conscious decisions are what matters tactically. The subconscious stuff has to be there. It's got to be there because you can't create it in the moment. Man, that's, that's so good. That's another great place to, to start wrapping it up. So, uh, man, thank you for that. There's a lot of great sound bites in this episode today, folks. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed, uh, Uh, viewing or listening to this so matt as we close it up 
where can folks find you? So I'm on IG at graybeard underscore actual. I'm on the internet at graybeardactual.com. And it doesn't matter which way you spell it. You can spell it with an E or an A, and it's still going to pop up to the website. Um, the blog that you talked about is on the website. Um, I'd love it if people read it because I'm, I'm kind of proud of some of it. I, I think uh, I think it's pretty good. And I'd love to get some feedback from guys. Um, all the classes, all my open enrollment classes are on the calendar on the website. We have kind of limited open enrollment offerings this year because I'm pretty busy with my other job with Staccato as well, traveling around to SWAT teams and police departments, doing demos and training on the pistols. So if you want an open enrollment class, go ahead and check on the website, look at the calendar. You can sign up right there. If you're a law enforcement professional or you're in the military and your unit or your agency would like a demo or you know any of the other things we offer, go ahead and reach out to me as well and I can help facilitate that. That's pretty much where to find me and what I have going on. It's a pretty full schedule already, but uh, <laughs> reach out and we'll try to squeeze you in if we can. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Again, just one last uh, uh, call out as far as uh, go, go to Matt's website to uh, get signed up for the class we have in, uh, it's basically Memorial Day weekend in May. Uh, and that's here in Northern Colorado. And uh, so looking forward to, to seeing you again at that point and, and being, you know, spending a couple of days with you on the range. And actually uh, you and I are going to go take a class after that one's over <laughs> from a couple of of the world's greatest uh, shooters yep, with the great one himself. Yeah. Rob Latham and Mike Seeklander. Uh, so it's going to be, be a busy weekend, but we're gonna have a great time. Um, also guys, again, uh, Matt will be instructing at our 2021 guardian conference. So don't forget, head on over to guardianconference.com and get signed up. We are so looking forward to seeing many of you there. I know some of you even watching today are planning on attending and, and it's going to be it's going to be a great weekend. I mean, there's going to be so many amazing opportunities, and I know everyone that attends is going to come away with with a lot of knowledge, information, education, and training, and can can take that home and get better. Just that, and that's the whole point is for us to all get better together uh, as we train. So. Guys, uh, it's been a great episode. Thanks again to Matt for his time uh, and Staccato as well. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to do it again, buddy. Oh, I, I always enjoy these. I can't wait. Looking forward to coming out in May too. All right. Well, with that, folks, we'll let you go. A reminder to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true.